Welcome back. So I have to level with you. I have some pretty high expectations or high hopes anyway for this video. If all goes well, by the end of this, we should finally have a working 5C drawbar for the new lathe, which also means we should have a working 5C collet system for the new lathe. I am legitimately excited about that. If you saw the last video, then you know what this is. This is the draw tube itself, which we made in that video. If you haven't seen it, I'll have a link in the description. For this video, we will be focusing on the handle or hand wheel that goes onto the end of the draw bar. This is the pattern that we will be using. The pattern fits together. There are two halves and it is aligned with these small quarter inch pins. Seeing as this is my first time casting anything, and I'm guessing is probably the first time for some of you as well, let's take a moment to talk a little bit about the process and how we got to where we are, because I've been doing a lot of prep work to get ready for this. First things first is the kiln. You can make one of these from just about anything. Mine, for example, is made from an old Thompson's water seal can. I've just cut the top off so that I can easily take it on and off. And then the inside is lined with a couple of special materials. First, or first layer anyway, is a ceramic insulation. This looks very similar to your normal pink insulation that you would put in your house, but this is made from ceramic instead of fiberglass and it is fireproof. It also helps to insulate temperature, so um, temperature doesn't pass through it very well. You can't see that layer, of course, because it is covered by castable refractory. This is specially formulated to resist high temperatures and to reflect those temperatures back into the kiln instead of absorbing the heat. This stuff is very similar to cement or mortar. You mix it up with water just like you would any other cement and all that I have done is just packed it by hand over top of the ceramic insulation, but I've seen others do a much better job where they will put something like a sauna tube into the center of their kiln, which will create a really nice, uniform, smooth shape. But you can see how I've just kind of slapped it on using my hands, and it works. It doesn't take much. It's very easy to do. Last but not least is this stuff, 100 HT ceramic coating. This stuff looks really similar to a mortar as well. However, this has a very high ceramic content and when you use this, you're actually going to mix it with a lot of water. Then you're almost going to paint it on as a last layer. This really light, almost white color, that's what the 100 HT looks like after it's cured. Because of the really high ceramic content in that stuff, it does a really good job of reflecting the heat back into the chamber. And that's really what all of these materials are designed to do. So what you should end up with when you combine them in this way is you should end up with an interior of your kiln that reflects all of the heat that your burner is generating back into itself and it doesn't soak that heat out into the external shell of the kiln and everything around it. Which brings us to the burner, the heart of the kiln. I have chosen to buy my burner because I'm not a rocket surgeon. This, I believe it's called the Godzilla burner and it is made by a gentleman who goes by the moniker Nobox7. He has a YouTube channel and he sells these on eBay. This burner is a monster. It's a forced air design. Your fuel goes in here and then your air source connects here and what comes out of this end here is insane. We will of course be doing just your basic sand casting. So I've put together 
a couple simple flasks here. This one will, of course, be for our pattern, and it just kind of locks together like this. Really simple. This, I guess, will just be sort of like an open top type deal for any leftover material that we have after the pour. Okay, honesty time. I think that it would be easy to watch this video and assume that this process went nice and smooth the first time around. However, I can assure you that that is not how it went at all. This took me several attempts, several different iterations, learning a little bit each time, and I would like to share that with you so that perhaps you can avoid some of that if you are going to try this for the first time yourself. First and foremost, if you are going to 3D print your pattern the way that I did, you're definitely going to want to do something to cover up those layer lines. I chose to use several layers of spray paint primer, which worked fairly well for me. Spray paint can be pretty tacky even when it's dried, and you're going to need to do something to keep that sand from sticking to the pattern. I ended up having to rub the pattern in graphite powder, and after I did that, I didn't have any more problems with sand sticking to it. And last but not least, packing the sand. When you pack your sand, you want to pack it firm, but not too tight. This shouldn't take all of your strength. If you pack it too tight, it will be difficult to get the patterns back out. Anyway, I hope that helps and maybe saves you a little bit of heartache. Wow, what a relief. If you had any idea how many times I have been right to this point and just had everything fall apart. But we have a pattern and it looks relatively decent. It's not without its issues. This side, it appears like I packed too tight and this side didn't pack tight enough. And what has happened is this side is protruding up above the lip of the flask and has pushed into this side. Hopefully that's not gonna give us any trouble as long as this goes back together. We are all set, we have our mold, and we are ready to talk about material. The material that we will be using is called Zamac, or more specifically, Zamac 12, ZA12. We are using this particular material because it is apparently specifically formulated to be good for sand casting. It's a very common material. A lot of common household items that are made from a casting are made from Zamac. This particular alloy is made from 11 to 12% aluminum, right around 1% percent copper and then the balance is zinc. This combination of materials gives it a relatively low melting point, makes it easy to pour and in general should be pretty easy to work with. So let's finally start casting.
Well, it's the next day. Everything's had plenty of time to cool overnight. Here's our little ingot that we made from the leftovers. To be completely honest, I am both excited and a little bit terrified to see what's inside of this box. I don't even want to think about doing this entire process all over again. But I guess it's time to quit flapping our gums, open this thing up, see what we've got. Okay, we're gonna find out together if we have exhilarating victory or crushing defeat. Would you look at that? I think we have a success. We just melted down metal and turned it into a thing in the real world. This is blowing my friggin' mind. It's not perfect. We've got some flashing and I don't know if it's just me or what, but it feels like this backside is a bit misshapen. I don't really know what happened there, but I mean, this is it. We just successfully cast our hand wheel. I am really, really excited. This is awesome. Okay, here is another look at it. This top surface actually came out really nice. It has a nice smooth texture to it. The bottom half, however, it looks like that bottom half of the mold must have cracked and the metal leaked into those cracks. You can also see that this bottom surface has a much rougher texture and I think the cracks and this rougher texture are both the result of not packing that bottom half of the the mold down quite as much as I should have. So there's definitely still a lot to learn, but in general, it is roughly the correct shape and I think it's gonna work for us. I will just go ahead and off camera, I'll get this thing cleaned up and prepped for machining. I'm just gonna take it over to the belt sander and clean up these surfaces, get this flashing off, etc., and meet you back here and we can talk about the next steps. Here it is after a couple of minutes on the belt sander. And the more that I clean this thing up, the more that I realize that I would like to try this again. This bottom section did indeed break apart and because of that, it is misshapen. It's just lumpy and lopsided and it's just wonky on this bottom section. Not to mention this surface is, is just not very nice at all. So I would like to melt this down and see if we can get an even better result straight out of the mold. However, there is unfortunately just no time for that. I am already pulling some seriously late nights in the shop just trying to get through this project. So we're just going to have to adapt and recover and do our best. This is our first cast part. So, you know, we're going to make the most of it. That being said, let's uh, head on over to the lathe and talk about what we're going to do next. Okay, so we have our part chucked up in the three jaw and we are ready to start working on these surfaces. Okay, so the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna hit this inner back surface here. It's just kinda rough and nasty, so we're gonna go ahead and clean that up. A lot of this surface is actually going to get drilled and bored out when all is said and done, but we're going to go ahead and clean it up here so that whatever is left over after all of that's finished will be a nice, clean, machined surface. Next up, we are gonna work on this sort of bottom of the donut shape here. This is the most misshapen part of the entire casting because this is the section where the mold broke. I ended up having to take off more of this surface than I had kind of initially anticipated or wanted, but I think in the end, it probably worked out for the best because this thing was kind of heavy when it came out of the mold and I think this is ultimately going to help to make it a little bit nicer in the hand. And 
last up, we are going to clean up this outside perimeter. Again, this is going to give it a little bit of a nicer feel in the hand, but this is also going to give us a nice surface to grip when we flip it around in the chuck to work on the front. We have quite a bit of drilling and boring to do when we turn this thing around, so having a nice firm grip in the chuck is going to make sure that it doesn't slip or move around on us. Alright, here is where we're at after some preliminary cleanup. Certainly not perfect, but you know, I think we knew that it wasn't going to be perfect. It has the right feel for what we need it to do. So let's keep moving forward, make the most out of it. We'll get this flipped around in the chuck. We'll start working on this end and uh, see where it takes us. Okay, so we have switched to the six jaw chuck and we are using the default jaws in this terrifying star configuration for two reasons. Number one, the outside diameter jaws on the three jaw are too shallow to grip enough of this part to make me feel comfortable that it's going to be able to hold on to it through all of the machining and drilling and everything else that we need to do while we have it flipped around and we're working on this end. Number two, the OD jaws for the six jaw chuck are just too big. So this is what we're going with. Let's go ahead and get started. We are going to of course start off by cleaning up this face and we'll go from there. Starting off with this front face here where all of this material is left over from the pour, it becomes quickly apparent that I should have began this process, at least on this face anyway, using the angle grinder and a cutoff wheel. But at this point, we're already in the lathe, we're already committed, so we're just going to follow through and finish it up. But yeah, just getting to the point where I could really start machining, it took quite a while and was pretty slow. However, we did eventually make it through, and for the rest of this segment, I will leave you with some not-so-zen machining footage. I think this is all that I'm going to take off of this front section, which means we are ready to start drilling and boring. We need to drill out a through hole straight through the center to match the through hole in the draw tube. And then we're also going to bore a three quarter inch deep section for a press fit on the draw tube. So let's get started and knock it out.
Okay, that is our through bore finished. This is bored to just over an inch and an eighth. That matches the bore on our draw tube. Next, we need to bore the section for the press fit on our draw tube. I've already measured the draw tube, and even though it's supposed to be an inch and three eighths nominal outer diameter, I've measured multiple times, and I keep getting one inch, 381 to one inch, 380 and like five or six tenths, depending on exactly where I measure. So for this section, we're gonna shoot for one inch, 379 thousandths. That should give us a one and a half to two thousandths press fit on the OD of that tube. Well, moment of truth where we find out if I blew it and ruined the entire part. Let's keep our fingers crossed. We're shooting for 1.379 here. That'll give us a two thou press fit. <laughs> I'll take that. I will definitely take that. All right, let's go get this thing pressed together. Everybody keep your fingers crossed that this flange doesn't just <laughs> crack in half when we press this shaft down there. I mean, come on. Everything after this is just details and finishing touches, really. We made a draw tube, we cast the handle. It did not come out looking too terrible. This is a functioning draw tube. We could literally stop right here and this thing would work. It would do the job. That being said, there are a couple of things that I still wanna do before we can call this project finished. For one, I would like to throw it back in the lathe, chuck up on the draw tube, and then just skim all of these surfaces. That will bring them all nice and concentric with the draw tube so that when it's in use and it's hanging out of the back of the lathe, it doesn't cause any vibration or balance issues. I think the other thing that I'll do is maybe even take off some additional material. I think I could maybe bring the size down just a little bit and that might make it a little bit more comfortable. I just threw it into the six jaw. I think that's plenty close enough, especially considering I really have no idea how true the outside surface of this DOM tube actually is. 
All right, so that's what we're gonna roll with. I will just do some final cleanup and shaping on these outside surfaces. I don't know that I'll film a whole lot of that. Maybe I'll just get some highlights because this video is already getting really long in the tooth. I have way more hours into this than I'd like to admit, and uh, I just need to get this done so that we can get this uploaded. I guess that about wraps it up for this one. I'll let you guys get a better look at this thing. I do have to apologize. This video is definitely going to release a couple of days later than I had originally wanted. And that's because I severely underestimated the amount of time and work that was gonna be required to complete this project. I think all said and done, I have a solid 80 hours into the project and video combined. It has been a ton of work, but I have learned so much along the way. And despite some stressful moments, a lot of really late nights in the shop and just a general level of exhaustion over the last couple of weeks, it has been a lot of fun to make. And so I hope that you enjoy watching the video at least half as much as I enjoyed making it. Also, I am very proud of what we've done here. Casting metal is no longer just some hypothetical thing that I would like to try someday. It is a new skill that I can now continue to practice and hone and learn and is a new tool that has been added to my toolbox. This opens up a whole new world of creative possibilities in the shop and I am really excited to explore that more in the future. So thank you again for coming along for the ride. Thank you for keeping me company out here. I legitimately couldn't have done it without you. Just knowing that you're out there pushes me and motivates me to do more try harder and be better than I would be otherwise. If you have made it this far into the video, thank you so very, very much. The channel is fast approaching 2000 subscribers, which is just mind boggling. <laughs> I can't even comprehend. So to those of you who are already subscribed, thank you again. Thank you. And to those of you who aren't subscribed, if you feel like I've earned it, give me a like and a subscribe. If you feel like I haven't, let me know what I can do better in the comments down below. And as always, until next time, get out there, make something cool. Most importantly, have some fun. And I hope to see you all again very, very soon.